Talking Justice 2016, presented by Bendigo's Loddon Compassby Community Legal Centre, a program of Arc Justice. I'm Mim, I'm the manager of Housing Justice. Housing Justice is the other Bendigo-based program with Arc Justice. We provide information, advice and support to tenants. Um, and I guess we see the everyday experience of inequity and the vulnerability it brings to that human right of shelter. We begin by acknowledging that we gather on the land of the Dja Dja Rung, whose ancestors and their descendants are the traditional owners of this country. We acknowledge their living culture, unique role in the life of this region, and that they continue to perform age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We also acknowledge their elders, past and present, and welcome members of their community who are with us today. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Martin Kreidia. Martin is the Gordon Samuels Professor of Law and Social Theory, Co-Director Network for Interdisciplinary Studies of Law at the University of New South Wales. He's a deep thinker, wonderful conversationalist, and we are very lucky to be in his hands again today. Please join me in welcoming Martin. It's, it's a very sad moment that's the last time I'll be hearing that. <laughs> but it was very nice while it lasted. Could we... Our panellists are here behind, and like all these panellists, very shy. Please, could you... <laughs> it's one of the introducer's sort of clichés or customs to say of whoever they're introducing that this person needs no introduction. And it's often not true. They do need introduction. <laughs> uh, but this time it's true. Uh, Tim Costello, everyone knows of, many know, uh, is one of Australia's most recognised voices on social justice, leadership and ethics. He's engaged in public debates on gambling, urban poverty, homelessness, reconciliation and substance abuse. He's the CEO of World Vision Australia, chairs the Community Council of Australia, the Australian Church's Gambling Task Force, and the National Australia Bank, that's my bank, Social Responsibility Advisory Council. He's published several books, served on numerous boards and committees. He's a delegate to the 1998 Constitutional Convention. He chaired the Communities and Families Stream at the Australia 2020 Summit served as a Baptist minister, executive director of an outreach service for the urban poor, and national president of the Baptist Union of Australia. In 2004, he was named Victorian of the Year. In 2005, he was made an officer of the Order of Australia. And in 2006, he became Victoria's Australian of the Year. When, uh, it looked, when it was clear that Tim might be a few minutes late, and we feared that he might not get here at all, I was thinking, well, what could I do to fill all the space? And I thought, well, I could just read accomplishments and that would get us, <laughs> get us the, the 20 minutes. But now I won't have to do that, and I'm very grateful, as I'm sure you will be, Tim Costello. Thank you. 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 Well, thank you, Martin, for that introduction. It's <clears throat> pretty much as I wrote it, really, so <laughs> <laughs> lovely to be uh, up here in Bendigo to bring my wife and daughter, who uh, seem to be more interested in something happening next door than what's happening in here. Uh, the big statue of Marilyn at the, uh, at the uh, turn roundabout there. Who would have thought Marilyn, Munro and Bendigo? But here we are, <laughs> bringing our family together uh, in adjacent buildings. So uh, There's an American Lutheran pastor, Edward Marquardt, who uh, tells the modern recasting of the Good Samaritan story. A priest walking down the road to Jericho finds a man badly beaten by robbers. The priest quickly administers the last rites and hurries back to his church to deliver a sermon about his experience. Another Christian pastor walks the Jericho Road and is appalled to see the beaten man, so he returns to his church to formulate a course on how Christians can help alleviate poverty. A revivalist watches the man being beaten on the Jericho Road on his TV and gathers thousands in the Jerusalem Bowl to sing songs about moral decay. A left-wing political activist sees the man beaten 
and organises a demonstration where thousands march on Parliament to demand social change. A right-wing moralist decides the economy needs to be changed so there won't be so much violence on the Jericho Road. He lessens taxes for the rich so the rich will have more money to make investments and increases the sales tax on the poor. <laughs> so all people can help pay for the costs of maintaining the Jericho Road. And while the priest, the pastor, the revivalist and the activist and the moralist, rich right-wing moralists are busy, the man on the Jericho Road dies. The tale is a universal parable about people not wanting to get involved with others who are suffering because of safety, because of money, because of time, because of inconvenience. So Edward Marquardt, who used this modern version in a sermon a couple of years ago, said the Jericho Road was always with us. He said the Jericho Road is any place where people are robbed, where people are robbed of their dignity where people are robbed of their love, where people are robbed of their food and clothing, robbed of their value as human beings. It's any place where there is suffering and oppression. Well, even in Australia, we live in a suffering world. There are people everywhere who are wounded and hurting and people who've been robbed, usually by circumstances beyond their control. Of course, in the actual story that was told, there's an interesting little time bomb planted that is often missed today. Jesus says this man, who was Jewish, presumably, on the Jericho Road, was stripped naked and left for dead. That's a time bomb, because it meant first to the Jewish priest, couldn't tell from any clothing or identification if he was Jewish. I'm sure the ethic of concern for one of his own religious and ethnic mob would have kicked in if he could have told, but he couldn't, and he passed on by. Likewise, the Levite, a, a lay person, but a student of the Torah, the Jewish law, couldn't tell if he was Jewish. And he couldn't tell there was no natural ethic that we all feel they do, they do bond, bond us, fellow Australian, any disaster that occurs, the first thing the foreign minister will announce, and she has done this just with the Egyptian airline, one Australian citizen. That is a very strong ethnic responsibility and sometimes, in some cultures, religious. Of course, the point of the story was the Samaritan couldn't tell either if he was Samaritan. This guy's stripped and beaten up. And the power of the story, who is my neighbour, is that the Samaritan, who can't answer if he's Samaritan or not, and that ethnic tie kicks in, simply sees a human. He sees a human. Now that's quite interesting for me. I was in the camps in Jordan uh, last year. World Vision's feeding 100,000 Syrian refugees in the Becca Valley. We're in sorry, in Lebanon, not Jordan, the Becca Valley, Lebanon. We're in Jordan, we're in Turkey, we're in Syria still, we're in northern Iraq, and we're seeing up close the violence and the suffering and the terrible exodus. And after I'd been in the Becca Valley, I was just walking back to my hotel room late at night in Beirut. And a man called me over and said, would you like a coffee? He spoke English. I said, thank you, that's lovely. He said, my house is here. I said, what's your name, Malak? He said, I'm Tim. You speak English, Malak? Oh, I was an orphan. The nuns took me in. I'm a Christian. They taught me English. That's why I speak good English. I walked in and there were about 15 Syrian refugees sitting in his lounge room around the coffee pot. I said, oh, you've got guests, Malak, I won't come in. He said, no, 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 they're not guests, they live here. I said, they live here? Do they speak English? No, no, they don't speak English. There were some women with full burqas, could only see their eyes. I said, Malak, um, who's caring for them and feeding them? He said, I am. How long have they been here? Six months. I'm trying to give them some work, they've got nothing else. He had a little soul of business. I said, Malak, 
As a Christian, I'm guessing, but you probably would be supporting President Assad. He said, yep, he's a butcher. Assad, by the way, has killed over 80% of all the 300,000 deaths in Syria. <clears throat> he said, I, I support him, though he's a monster, because as an Alawite, Shia minority, he will at least protect Druze and Shias and Christians and minorities. If the Sunni rebels win, they won't. It'll be curtains for us. I said, these refugees, Syrian refugees living in your home, who are they supporting? Ah, oh, he said, they're supporting the uh, Sunni rebels. They get up, face Mecca, they pray that the rebels will win. I said, you know, Mike, I know a little bit about political tensions in the same family under the same roof. <laughs> but this is incredible. I said, why do you do this, Malak? And he looked at me and he said, because they're humans. Different tribe, different religion, different politics, be it, they were humans. I realised he was telling me the story of the Good Samaritan 2,000 years earlier, a few kilometres down from Beirut. Of course, the version I've read to you is literally used politically today. Our former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, in the Thatcher Lecture, strong Christian faith, Tony Abbott, lectured Europe that the wholesome sentiments of the Good Samaritan were leading them astray. It was appropriate he did it in a Thatcher lecture. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher had once reflected on the Good Samaritan and been asked what the point was when she was Prime Minister and she said the point of the Good Samaritan is the Good Samaritan had money in his pocket and therefore was in a position to help economically. <laughs> That's the point. Now that's a point. I don't think it's the main point. Her point was you've got to be, and she went on and said this, self-sufficient and prosperous if you want to do good. That's the point she saw. Well, the question of justice has always fascinated me and, pu and puzzled me. Very simply, why do some people get far more than they need and some people miss out altogether? If we uh, all have universal rights, or if you have a faith position like mine, which undergirds that, we are all made in the image of God. That's why I think war is wrong. How do you destroy the image of God in someone else who's not necessarily your enemy? I find when the church blesses war, this particularly troubling. Jesus said, love your enemy. See the image of God in the other person and actually believe through love you might be able to turn them from an enemy. Abraham Lincoln, of course, picked this up. He was in a politically strong situation. His advisers were urging him to crush his political enemies, not be so nice to them, but to really crush them. And Lincoln said, but if I make my enemy my friend... Do I not destroy my enemy? Picking up really that insight. Well, the question of justice and who's the enemy, who's the outsider, who's the insider when there are universal human rights is always with us. If we are all children of God and if those of us born in Australia have options, opportunities that others born elsewhere through the great lottery of latitude, we win first prize in the lottery, clean water, universal health, universal education, but 500 metres of water between some of the Torres Strait Islands and PNG. On one side, Australia, only six women per 100,000 live births die in labour. The other side, over 320 women per 100,000 of live births die. In labour. You go, what's the moral significance of that little bit of water, 500 metres, in this lottery? PNG, you drew one of the last tickets in the lottery. So, this has always been a question. Now, when we think about justice, it is complex. 
Amartya Sen in his book The Idea of Justice has a, a metaphorical picture of three children fighting over who will get to own a flute. And the first child says, I should have the flute because I'm the poorest child, I have no other toys. If I had the flute, it would be my only toy. The other two agree this child is so poor he has no toys. There's a strong egalitarian fairness argument for justice. The second child says, I should have the flute because unlike these other two, I'm the only one who can play the flute. Here's a strong utilitarian argument. It will maximise pleasure for myself and maximise pleasure for the listeners. What use is the flute to these other two? They can't play it. The third child says, I should have the flute because I'm the one that made this flute. And when I'd finished making it, these two turned up and claimed what was mine. Now here is a very strong neoliberal argument of property rights. Now, just as a straw poll, let me ask you, how many thinks the first child, the poorest, should get the flute out of interest? Hands up. A scattering. How many think the second child that can get most pleasure should get the flute? About the same. How many thinks the third child should get it? Hmm, interesting. When I do that in most audiences, it's overwhelming <laughs> that the third child should have the flute. And in most of our thinking, that is a strand of justice that we privilege. All are strands of justice, I have to be honest. I think the first child should get the flute. The egalitarian part of me has always been very strong. I think the other two have claims, and there may be circumstances absolutely where that's right. But for me... It's a bit like who owns the sky as we try and deal with climate change. If it is the West and we've pumped most of the carbon up there and had our industrial growth and have our prosperity and say you can't now make us sacrifice that because our democratic societies will not tolerate really us curbing emissions to our own growth costs, who owns the sky? The egalitarian argument, of course, from the poorer nations is, well, you've had your growth, and we haven't, and therefore this disproportionate benefit you have in justice should actually be sacrificed. Most of the arguments around the global commons, that's just the climate change arguments, actually have these strands of justice going on. And usually the position where we sit is how we see reality. That's one thing I think Karl Marx got right. He actually said, you see reality from where you sit. You see it through those lens. I don't think we can actually challenge some of the great global challenges we have. And we can talk about people movement and refugees and climate change and we can talk about global epidemics. We can even talk about the massive growing inequality in our world. 61 individuals now have the same wealth as 3.5 billion people. 61 individuals. How much food can any one person eat? How many roofs do you need to keep the rain out? How does this inequality, which isn't just a moral issue, but now even The Economist magazine, right of centre, says it is the biggest obstacle to economic growth. This inequality blowing out. It actually hurts even the rich to allow inequality to keep growing because of the ferment of societies that see the unfairness. For me, the utilitarian argument has always been strong. I worked for 15 years as a lawyer. I saw the gap between what courts deliver and what justice really is, the gap between the rule of law and human rights that get abused, even with advances like the International Criminal Court. It is still largely weaker nations, African nations, whose leaders can be picked up in a NATO helicopter and dropped in The Hague and tried. 
It's, of course, America has never signed up to it because for Americans, by definition, they manifest destiny. They are the embodiment of justice and freedom. So how could their soldiers or citizens be subject to international criminal court uh, restraints? And of course, powerful nations can't be tried. Now, it's a great step, the International Criminal Court. But we know that to enforce human rights, you only really have a chance if it is governments that are weak enough to be pressured, sanctioned, handing over their ex-leaders, presidents, abusers, to, to actually do that. So that bell means I've got to finish. How long? Five minutes. Five minutes, OK. So these strands of justice are very important to me. I might just in the last five minutes say that yesterday I, with church leaders and uh, aid agency heads, uh, stood with Tanya Plibersek as she made an announcement in Sydney to restore the just the latest cut to Australian aid of uh, $224 million in Scott Morrison's budget. It's the third cut. The budget savings the Coalition Government have made, 25% of them have come from aid. Aid's only 1% of the budget, but 25% of their savings have come from aid. So, aid which was at 34 cents in $100 of gross national income, with bipartisan support to go to 50 cents in $100, is now down to 21 cents. The rest of the world is going up. Europe, with much greater debt, is going up, recognising that if you cannot give hope to people in camps who are Syrian refugees and to Africans, they're going to be on boats and they're going to be heading to Europe or to Australia. Aid funds a whole lot of the climate change challenges that we have. We as a nation, because we can, and people who are recipients of aid don't vote, have smashed it. 30% cut. In our region, we don't give any aid to Africa anymore, all gone. And yet Africa, as William Hague, a conservative leader in a fine speech just a month or two ago said, if you think the Syrian refugee crisis is big, have a look at what's coming from Africa if we do not give hope and jobs to the young demographic time bomb there. The world is a waterbed. You press down in one place, it comes up another, and we've smashed out. Britain, Scandinavian countries, the Dutch are all at 0.7. 70 cents and $100. That's the international promise. David Cameron, a conservative leader, when under pressure to cut aid, not only increased it to 0.7, but legislated it at 0.7 and said, we won't balance the books on the backs of the poorest. Tony Abbott smashed it. That's continued uh, with Scott Morrison and Turnbull's budget. So in a global world, in a global village, this question of justice, utilitarian, neoliberal, it's ours, property rights, this is what worries me about the climate change debate, our right, we made it. Yeah, we might have put the carbon up there, but it's our lifestyle and we're not sacrificing it. These things aren't soluble unless we actually have a strand of justice that understands the imperative of this utilitarian argument also. So a small announcement from Tanya Plibersek, just a quarter of a billion. Of course, Julie Bishop said, well, it's uncosted and this is wrong. And the press asked me, how can Labor pay for this 224 million uh, restoration? I said, you know, 224 million is just two weeks of the tax cuts of 50 billion once they're rolled out for corporates. I don't even know businessmen that would give up, wouldn't give up two weeks. I said, you know, the 224 million at most is a couple of periscopes on the 12 submarines that are costing us 50 billion dollars. It goes right to the question of values as the rest of the world looks at the Australian government and says, what a nation of shirkers, third richest nation on earth, now 19th of developed countries in its aid levels proportionately. It makes me ashamed, but it does go to this egalitarian argument of justice. Thank you.
Thanks, Tim. Uh, one of the themes, apart from the egalitarian theme that Tim emphasised, was this earlier theme of seeing another person as a person rather than a category. And I was, that resonated with me particularly because I was, I was a month ago in Israel and Palestine and I met uh, the, a guy called Aaron Barak who was the former Chief Justice mm. of Israel and the father of their human rights uh, jurisprudence. And he was telling me his story and part of it was that during the war he was a little boy in Lithuania uh, and he, his father and mother, were thrown into the uh, Kaunas, the, the now called Kovno, ghetto in, in uh, Lithuania. And the first thing that the Nazis did in 1941 was exterminate all the children, and he was a child. So his father said to his mother that she and the boy would have to get out. His father stayed and survived the ghetto. And he said, look, it wasn't so hard to get out of the ghetto, but the trouble was that the, the uh, Lithuanian populace hated Jews so much that nobody was trying to get out because you would be killed once you were out. But we knew some people in a village, and they took us in. And it was an extraordinary thing that they did because they built a kind of room with a small, uh, with a secret, secret wall. We couldn't go out in the day at all because in a village everyone knows everyone and we would have been denounced and killed. But more than that, they, all of them, there were three boys in the family, would have been killed. He said, recently, in the last few years, uh, I, he, was invited to to Lithuania to give a lecture at the Lithuanian Constitutional Court. And I asked that this family, his family had been supporting this Lithuanian family after the war in any event, I asked that the survivors of the family be invited to, uh, to come to my lecture. And I was talking to them later and I asked one of these now men, how was it that your parents did it? What could they, I mean, who could do that? Because they were not only threatening their own lives, but your lives. And the guy apparently said, uh, I don't understand your question. You were in danger of death and it was our Christian duty. Mm. Now, Christian duty, some other religion's duty, that notion that you can see the personhood and the, the, the predicament of someone else as a predicament for which you feel some, in this case, potentially fatal responsibility is an extraordinary thing. Barak said, I asked my daughter, would I have done that? And she said, no, I don't think you did that. Uh, now, we're talking about uh, matters of diversity and recognition, and our next guest, Sujit Kaur Khalsa, she said it's pronounced like salsa, and I was scared that's what I ended up <laughs> saying, came to prominence with her appearance on Australia's Got Talent. She describes herself as a spoken word artist, workshop facilitator, actor, producer, MC, and humanitarian. That's a self-description, it's not unflattering, it's very nice. As a young, first-generation Australian Sikh woman, she uses her experiences to question conventional notions of Australian national identity and to challenge racism. Her poetry tackles some core social issues like gender inequality, identity uh, issues and, and feminism. She made it to the finals of the National Australian Poetry Slam in, I'll come back to that in a moment. In 2014, she's a first-generation Australian Sikh storyteller. Uh, her writing predominantly focuses on stories of the Sikh diaspora family, cultural confusions, and gender. She's still discovering the art form of slam poetry, which is good because I've not yet discovered it. <laughs> you reveal it. And she moved from Perth, where she lived and where her education was, and currently resides in what she calls the big city of Melbourne, but she's done us the honour of visiting the small city of Bendigo. <laughs> Please, Sukhji. Nicole's getting tired, you know how she feels. Martin's about to fly, you know how he feels. Tim's looking fine, you know how he feels. 
It's a Sunday on an autumn day here in Bendigo and we're feeling good. Denim, denim, denim. That was a test to see if you guys would click or not. <laughs> Bendigo, what's going on? Click for me. Far out. The reason why I'm getting you to click is so you can get warmed up because in spoken word we do a thing where when, when a performer's up here and they're fully vulnerable as, as possible and sharing their story and their truth, they want to know that the audience also gets what they're saying. So when I perform two poems today, you can stop clicking now. Um, <laughs> when I perform two poems today, I would really appreciate if you click when you feel a line or when you feel um, anything, even throughout the panel actually, if you feel something, let's just click all, all, all day. Why not? <laughs> um, and now I'm going to be really annoying and I'm going to be that teacher that you hated in high school, and I'm going to get you all to come as close as possible um, to the front. Because, for spoken word, that's right, get up, come on. Because, for spoken word, um, it's a very intimate um, discussion. And for me, um, while you guys are getting up, I'm going to share a story about world vision. Um, because when I was in year four, Tim, I actually, um, I was actually just sitting here and I remembered where my um, love for justice and my love for international aid and development and my love to change the world actually began in year four when I did the 40-hour famine and I had a teacher called Mr Burns and he was so passionate about world vision and he tried to instill that in, in all of us. And I was that one student in class who was a nerd and really picked it up and really dedicated. That's it was great. an honour to meet Fantastic. you, Tim, um, and to know that, thank you, I am, I am who thank I am you. because of people like Tim. <laughs> so I'm not here to talk about Mr Burns, unfortunately, I'm sure he would love that, but I am here to talk about how storytelling, and thank you so much for moving to the front, I appreciate that, I know how annoying it is when people tell you to do that, um, when your seat <laughs> is nice and warm, um, and I'm sorry if my backs are towards you guys, if you guys are cool with that, that's fine. Um, so, how spoken word, um, spoken word poetry and storytelling is a way for me to talk about justice and a, a way for me to express myself um, because my brother's a lawyer and it's very hard to argue with him. So that's why I had to find something new to argue with and I, you, I chose storytelling um, because when we talk about statistics, when we talk in Tony Abbott's voice, um, a lot of young people don't listen and for a way for me um, to get the human connection and bring it back home is to let people into my life and into my shoes and into my world. Um, and I feel that if we're doing it honestly and if we're doing it truthfully and we're doing it with love, um, there's nothing that can go wrong with that. So the first piece I'm going to do um, is called To Advance Australia Fair. Um, and before I do it, I thought um, as a little exercise, um, we would learn how to pronounce my name because it's all about, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in a school where every time the teacher read out my name, she would freak out and just kind of pause. So I was the pause. And I knew when it paused, it was my turn to put my hand up. <laughs> I'm here, miss. I'm here. So for all the exotic people, maybe in this room or maybe in the world, let's do something for them. Um, I, told, I told myself, that every time I perform, I'm going to do this because it's really important to break down that barrier of difference and really clap out the syllables in my name. So, my name's Sukjeet, and we're gonna, when I say Suk, you say Jeet. Is that possible? Possible? Perfect. So, when I say Suk, you say Jeet. Suk! Jeet. Suk! Jeet. That's not loud enough. I know it's Sunday. I had to wake up at like 6.30 and drive. Now, you from Melbourne, so I think you guys need to spruce it up, Bendigo, and we're going to get some energy out of you. Is that possible? So, when I say sook, you say jeet. Sook. Jeet. Sook. Jeet. Sook. Jeet. If you're not in Australia, where the bloody hell are you? <laughs> Remember the bingle jingle? Inviting the world to mix and mingle. Where a fair go was your welcome mat. Unless you're of caramel descent, then ain't nobody got time for that. You see, rocking up for my first job at Coles was like a scene on Border Patrol. <laughs> Her plastic tag read Dorothy, glasses corded, she hawked, Do you have a visa, honey? <laughs> Caught in a truck's light, I was a squirrel digging for my Mastercard. 
caught at a job interview with a question off guard. She repeated it again, this time slowly, so I could follow. We don't want no illegal workers here in Australia, honey. <laughs> Bravo! What makes you Australian? Is it a Southern Cross tattoo or wombat stew crumbled with a dunkaroo? As if my Aussie passport is temporary or my birthplace a mistake. For all you Dorothys out there, allow me to firmly iterate for those who've come across the seas. We've boundless planes to share. With courage, let us all combine to advance Australia fair. Upon hearing these lines, do you think of a time when Australia's learnt to share and care and dare to wear its heart on its face, fully aware that most of us in this place are far from fair? but brown and black and slow to attack, but quick to embrace a warm Australia, a handmade Australia. Not a shooing Australia when idiots spit Osama at my brother. I'm confused as to why. On Australia Day when the night sky spews bigot bile, I'm left traumatised. When a teen rips off my uncle's turban, I'm an enraged flame of pain and shame and sorrow. For tomorrow, when a hooning ute throws a rotten peach at my dad and screams, Go home, you bloody terrorist! I plead to you, where the bloody hell are we? My people, the Sikhs, yeah, we have an identity, just like you and, and him and her, like Prue and Jim and Fleur. You see this hair? It's long and preened and seen. It stands for me and my choices. You'll see that turban. It belongs here in suburban Melbourne to Perth. It says, hey, mate, we're all equal on Earth. And Dorothy, if it's really a competition, well, maybe, maybe I'm more Aussie than you. If Aussie means equality, because that turban, it's noble. From start to end, it's worn to defend you. And you, 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 and you. You can trust me, it says. Sikhs and turbans came here in 1860 with camels and carts and courageous hearts and look at the maxi taxi. We're still driving and steering the country in offices, in hospitals and even on stage to advance Australia fair page by page. So bring on the slurs and curs and scars and burrs. Take it for the team. Bring the racists into high beam. Let them spew their poison in my direction. So another won't have to cop this disaffection. Shut the gate on the hate state. So when people tell me and my family to go home to where we came from, I reply with a smile, tongue in cheek. Mate, we've been right at home for the past 200 years. I'm not the one that's a freak. I'm fully sick. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to get a, some water. There you go. There you go. I appreciate the clicks. I've heard some. That's a, that's a little kick up the bum to everyone click as well. Um, so... My name's Sujit, it actually translates to winner of peace. So already, when I was pushed out of the bosom, I already had massive shoes to fill. So I'm not Rosa Parks, I'm not Nelson Mandela, but I can try, I can try. <laughs> so I did, I did a bit of um, international aid and development in university, thinking I would work in the United Nations, and so did every 500 other people when we rocked up to our first day of university. Um, and then I would Google um, United Nations um, job descriptions. And... You know, when I read them, they went on for like 10 pages and, and the, the criteria that was needed, I was like, oh, does that mean I can only make change when I'm like 50? Does that mean I just sit there in my room and watch some Netflix and then when I turn 50, I'm like, ping, okay, now I can make change. And then I was like, no. I think that, you know, I, I don't know how many young people there are in the room. There's a couple. There's a couple of high school students and some university people, I can tell. Um, and I don't know if you guys experience this, but a lot of people um, in society tend to think that the only way to make change is, um, is to have a million bucks. 
and I, you know, so when I'm Angelina Jolie, I will be able to adopt every child in the world, and I'll, I would have made change. Thank you so much. I can't wait. But I didn't have a million bucks. I don't even know how to make a million bucks. And then I was like, okay, well, you know, once I hit a very high position, that's when I can actually make change. And in between, I won't do anything. But then... I think as young people, we actually can. And, and, you know, I'm 21 years old and you know, I'm such a nana and everyone assumes I should be raving right now. And, I, and people get really shocked when, you know, I had a lot of interviews after Australia's Got Talent and a lot of people would say, oh, that's a, that's a, lot, of, that's a lot of things to think about for a 21-year-old. I'm like, well, why isn't it? I think that's the way you go about doing life and the way I want to go about doing life. Thank you very much the way I want to go about doing life and making change. I have lots of fun doing what I do and I get to, you know, a lot of the time people would say, you know, your nine to five job is going to be so boring. Oh, it's work life. Wait for that, Sukjeet. And I'm like, when I got, I was like, no one tells you. You can actually love what you do and you can <laughs> choose a career that you love. I'm sure you love what you do. Mm, do. And, and that's what we need. So I'm just ranting right now. But <laughs> when it comes to, when it comes to, a <laughs> spoken word is pretty much ranting anyway. Um, <laughs> When it comes to making justice, so I come from the Sikh faith. There was a bit of that in the in the poem that you just heard. Um, so coming from the Sikh faith, um, we are very much about the justice. Now the reason is because we've also been through a lot of trauma and genocide in India and been persecuted for our faith. So that has binded us and we've all spread throughout the world and my parents chose Australia and they came to Australia and I was born there um, in Perth and I feel that if it wasn't for that, um, if it wasn't for my faith, if it wasn't for my upbringing, I wouldn't have the values that I would have. And sure, that poem was about being a Sikh girl. Sure, that poem was about the incidents, all very true. Everything I write about is all verbatim, so it's all word for word what people have said. Um, so watch out all of the ex-boyfriends who say stuff and ends up in like Adele-style poetry. Um, so all this, that, that happened to be a Sikh narrative. But what that represents is that a lot of um, migrants that come to Australia, um, they do face a lot of injustices. And, you know, I feel that having an identity, yeah, I just look like a hairy Indian, but look, my brother and dad, who have a turban and beard, um, especially not after 9-11, have copped a lot of crap. And that's not... And I don't think that's fair, and that's what drives me, and that's, my, that's where the passion comes from. So, yeah, that's one side of the poetry, and there's also the, um, the feminist type of poetry that I do as well, which is about being a woman. I do acknowledge that I have a lot of privilege in this country. I'm very lucky. I've been given all these opportunities, but it's, I feel like I don't know my purpose yet, but I'm finding my purpose, and a bit of that purpose is to give voice to the voiceless, because there's a lot of women out there that can't actually that can't actually speak about certain topics. So, um, you know, I feel like the system, I don't think the system is made in the favour of the woman. So when it comes to reporting rape or sexual abuse or domestic violence, um, it's, if, I, if I got raped right now and I went to the police office, I'm not sure how much. Um, also, there's, I, I also recently learnt um, through working with victims of rape and domestic violence that there's a lot of shame in a lot of communities when it comes to that. Um, already as a woman, and then you add that cultural stuff on top of it, and it's just like, ah, who in that right, who in that moment will feel like, yes, I'm going to go to the police now? They're trying to deal with all their mental stuff, and then if they choose to report a couple of months later, then what happens? Then I don't think that you know you can prove this type of stuff. Where is the semen? Where's the where's the actual bruises? Was it? Oh, maybe we're just going to blame you. And so, anyways, I'm ranting again. This next piece. This next piece is about... Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to get you guys to close your eyes. Can we all close our eyes to fully um, enjoy this piece? How long have we got? Uh, we've got six minutes. Perfect. Okay, cool. I'll get you to close your eyes, and then we can... Um, I always, I'm sorry, I always start 20 stories and never finish them, so when we do the panel stuff, you can ask anything you want, um, an open book. So I want you to close your eyes, um, and... I want you, um, the reason why, just let me keep talking and close your eyes. Um, I want you to visualise 
um, that you are in my shoes. Um, because I think when it comes to empathy, when it comes to practicing empathy, we sometimes forget um, that in order to step into someone else's shoes, we need to take off our own shoes. We need to take off our own filters, our own judgments. So when it does come to um, you know the current Islamophobia in Australia, or um, the refugees, or the Syrian refugees, like Tim was talking about, or when it comes to international aid and development and putting funding in aid, international aid, um, it's very hard sometimes as Australians because we're very lucky. Um, to put ourselves in other people's shoes. So I think for this um, next piece, I'd like you to put yourself in my shoes um, and experience the day in the life of a long-haired girl. Um, Hands up if you watch the news every night and can't decide on fight or flight or might is right. Hands up, everybody, and wave them in the air like you just care. He told me, my bro, leave this earth better than at your birth when you go. So I look at these hands, two brown hands. One day I heard my mum say, my name's Sujit, it means winner of peace. So I thought I had to be a political feature, a spiritual preacher, anything but this hairy-legged creature. But then I saw the hands. My big sister said to me, hold my hand, ban baby, and look with me. When you gaze at this country, what do you see? Do you see stats or spirits, boundless plains or borders? When you gaze at the stars, do you see southern crosses or seven sisters? My hands have hope. So don't protect me from the world, Papa. My hands like yours are for working, Papa. Come build with me an empire of empathy. Friends, hold my hand and walk the streets with me. Do you see the superheroes every day, white, black and grey, curly and straight, giving their time of day, helping me on my way, laughing and having their say, teaching their kids like, I'll teach mine to tend and mend and spend the time on another. Because a stranger is not always danger. So wave those hands, wave hello, shake those hands, shake them off, yo. Use those hands to touch, not type or like or emoji wink, you're all right. You'll feel the love and compassion no text can provide. Take a stand, hands, they're yours. I might be the wordsmith, but with your applause, action this poetry and find your cause. Join this girl from Perth on a mission to leave this earth better then we found it at our birth. Thank you so much for having me and letting me rant. Mm. And we'll talk soon. I'm an academic, and so it's not usual for an academic to think of spending a two-day seminar on justice in a theatre, actually two theatres. Usually it's around the table, a few mints, people that... (laughs) asleep here or there and that's the way we do it because we pretend to each other and to ourselves that that's the way you talk about serious issues. Well today and last night we discovered that there are different ways to get people to think about some of the most fundamental issues and I'm very grateful that we did learn that Mm. again today. And now you get your chance to get your own back. Uh, We have up up to half an hour for Q&A. Thank you so much both of you, Tim and Sukjit. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for the storytelling and that's something, like I've, I've created an organisation, Make a Change Australia, to help people, support people that want to create change and one of the biggest things that I see is Um, the need for people to speak up and have a voice for what they're passionate about. Mm. I'd love to hear from both of you, how do we teach more people to be okay to have their voice and share what they're concerned about and encourage others to join them? I think it's really important. Um, I think as society, we aren't encouraged to be vulnerable. And I think in terms of to get to the point of sharing what you want to share and sharing your passions and your story, you first need to acknowledge your vulnerabilities. Um, and it's it's extremely scary. I get it. It's a scary thing to do. Um, and I think that, for me, was built through resilience and through the... I got bullied in high school, um, you know, 
and I think that going through experiences that were quite um, at times traumatising and harsh is what's created my confidence, my confidence to say, you know what, um, I want to share my story and also to acknowledge that, you know, I'm still learning, we're still growing and evolving as humans, um, no matter what the age difference might be between me and Tim, I still feel that um, we both have a right to share our story in Australia and I think that's... Um, yeah, and if you're talking about like um, specifically in Australia with your organisation, I think that maybe to recognise that um, is with the birth lottery, if you've been given, like I feel like if I've been given a body that thankfully works um, and I haven't, and I've got a brain in my head, I've got feet in my shoes, I can steer myself in any direction I choose. And I feel that in a lot of countries, my, my view on that is that in a lot of countries people don't have. So as soon as maybe people realise that they're, um, they're privileged and to realise that, oh my goodness, I've actually got this opportunity to share, so why not? Um, and I think that might be exposure to the rest of the world. Um, it's very easy to live in a bubble. I love living in a bubble. It's so comfy. But when we step out of that bubble and we explore um, sometimes the harsh realities of the world that we live in, um, I think that's when, I don't know if that answered it, sorry. But vulnerability is the <laughs> way to go and honesty. And yeah, there was a lot of anger in that first poem, right? There was a lot of anger. And the reason why there was is because it's so personal to me. But at the same time, it's for me, it's about channeling that anger and whatever that sadness or that sorrow into something creative and into something positive. And that's, I think that's how, yeah, how to do it. So uh, thanks to referring to the age difference between us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now of that age where uh, on uh, trains, young people sometimes stand up. <laughs> up the, uh, this is very unnerving. <laughs> I can see them looking at me, and I don't feel, you know, really old, but I can see them looking at me thinking, God, he looks old. What would it be like to be that old? <laughs> um, so, but I, I, I say that because I think I speak for all of us. See, hearing your passion and the stories you're telling gives us a lot of hope in Australia, a lot of hope that uh, there is a whole generation who uh, are living out of a different story. You mentioned stories. I think we do live out of stories. I think... Uh, the great story of the West and Australians have bought into it is pretty simple and pretty uh, seductive. It's the wealthier I am, the happier I'll be. Now, there is truth in this story. In World Vision work, if as a parent you can't guarantee enough calories for your child not to be malnourished, or you don't have enough wealth to guarantee clean water and an education, the moral panic and failure you feel as a parent is quite terrifying. But we know, and uh, some demographers have uh, done this work, uh, and sociologists, that once you hit a threshold, in Australia they reckon it's about $60,000, $65,000. Greater wealth doesn't lead to greater happiness. It actually leads to greater drivenness and stress and being time poor, and therefore relationship poor. You're not with friends and community, not actually following things that are your passion. So this wealth to happiness story is a very dominant story that really says human rights are expendable. We know that in trade agreements, if we're going to have an important trade agreement, we've got to turn the volume down on China's human rights policy and find a way to negotiate that. Um, and I don't say that's simple, because if you don't actually have economies which are growing and where there is that sense of hope. Uh, social dissonance, think Germany in the 1930s, think uh, that social dissent can absolutely lead to terrible breaches of human rights. This is, this is a fine balance. But I do think uh, finding a deeper, truer story is really important. Going to Martin's experience with his Lithuanian uh, Israeli friend. Um, you know, uh, Viktor Frankl, who survived Auschwitz, uh, came up with logotherapy and purpose therapy. He, he survived, he would say, in one part because the Nazis had control of life and death over him and of his every movement in Auschwitz. 
but he said they didn't have control of my mind and I could choose to meditate on beauty and love and things that were a free space when there actually wasn't by any human comparison free space and then he said those few of us that survived and the question in Auschwitz was only will we survive we had a more terrifying question after we'd survived. The question was, survive for what? Now I think that's actually the profound question that we all have to answer and then live out of a story that is a reasonable answer to that question. What is it all about? What actually is this deeper meaning? Why are we here and how do we live? And I don't think the wealth to happiness story uh, that usually crunches, we're seeing it in this election, human rights, boat people, uh, you know, illiterate, innumerate people are going to take our jobs. You know, the, the logic of this, if they're illiterate and innumerate and they're getting all the jobs, <laughs> why are we wasting so much money on education? <laughs> and if, you know, we say, oh, well, it doesn't lead to a job education, but it's a cultural good. Well, if it's a cultural good and we're educated and we don't want to do those jobs because we're educated, well, we are going to need illiterate, innumerable people to do the jobs because we even educated people don't want to do them. I mean, it's, it's a really perverse, racist, you know, fear that somehow our wealth is going to be held back by, by these people. But I think thinking the story that you live out of and being able to articulate that is profoundly important. And just to add to that, I feel like in order to make change, a lot of the time, like in my little cool, I live in Brunswick, so very lefty, feminist, vegan, everyone's got henna, bindies, everything, right? <laughs> Every barista's got a beard. Like, it's, a, it's, I, it's very comfy going back to that bubble of, you know, sticking to that circle. And, you know, a lot of the NGOs that I worked with, sometimes just hanging out with those same type of people, all my spoken word nights where we're all, you know, believing in the same things that we believe in. And and for me, I don't believe that's where change is going to happen. I feel that that's why I had to go on Australia's Got Talent. I didn't go on there because I thought, oh, that's my claim to fame. And, oh, look, I'm going to get famous. I'm going to get to meet these. No! It's because I knew that would be the most amount of people I could reach in that time. And people who wouldn't necessarily have that conversation with me. So what I urge, a lot of my you know, um, people, young people who are wanting to make change when I go to high schools, I say, you know what, have a conversation with your bully. Because I had that one day and I feel that that is how I've got closure in life and that is how I have been able to, you know, this whole one person at a time mentality. I think that sometimes it can be quite overwhelming when we're like, we want to make change, change in the whole world, all these issues going on, bad, 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 what do we do? And you're like, oh, nothing, because I can't do any of it, let's just watch TV. So instead, actually going out, like when people catcall, I have conversations with my catcallers and I walk up to the car and be like, what next? Do you have anything else? Else to say and they're like and it's just great and then you explain feminist theory we have a bit of a conversation have a conversation with a bigot have a conversation and that's why that's what I feel change is not going to happen with our little comfortable circles change is actually going to happen in the really hard places um, that maybe a lot of people don't want to go into but I think it's necessary I, I just want to bring some aged wisdom to this conversation. Uh, <laughs> Tim is not yet old enough to know that there's one thing worse than having young people stand up for you, and that is having old people stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Who next? Who next? Yes, please. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming up to Bendigo this morning. Um, Tim, your uh, piece about the Good Samaritan reminded me about a famous psychology experiment where they um, experimented on seminary students on the way to deliver a lecture about the Good Samaritan who come across someone in need. Um, and a good proportion of those students stop and help. But they then put the students under time pressure um, saying that they were late for their lecture and the number who actually stopped and helped cr crashed dramatically. Um, and I think that's true of all of us, that the busyness and the time pressure stop us being able to see others as human. Um, have you got any advice about how we can maintain that clarity? Do, 
a question yeah. to both of you. So um, I, I think that busyness is actually a feature of some of that dominant story I was talking about. That somehow life is a race, he who dies with the most toys wins. Um, I think it is part of a, a storyline that says it's shameful to fail. All of my growth has been through failures. I'd much prefer success has given me them any day, but I've never really grown through success. Mm. I've actually grown through the process of failing, reflecting, often saying, can I get up and have a go again? And I think the busyness is a sort of cultural, uh, you know, rat race of this sense that there's some goal and I haven't actually stepped back and thought, what, what is this all about? Um, <clears throat> you know, the deeper questions uh, always require silence and deep thought and time. You, you, you rarely arrive at the answer to these deeper questions when you're busy uh, because that's already a, a default setting that's got you running. Um, which is why I think retreats and meditation and, you know, I think women do this much better than men. Um, when women say to each other, let's have a coffee, they know what they're going to do. They're going to talk for a good couple of hours and workshop every emotion and nuance. And <laughs> when men say they have the coffee, they drink it in two minutes and they've had the coffee and they go. <laughs> it was a coffee. Uh, so um, even the way we often men do our lives, it's got to be outcome and there's a sort of a shame to actually admit that it's just luxurating in time with the ability to to think and go deeper. So, uh, yeah, I do think it's really, really uh, connected to actually the story that we are living out of. I, um, I think that coming... Cause like, all I can speak on behalf of is my own story and my upbringing because I don't know what happened in your lives. Um, we haven't had that much time to get to know each other. Um, but in... As a Sikh, I've always um, seen the way my parents um, treated others in, the, in society. So I think that from that I took that I've always wanted to be a leader and I never knew what style of leader I would have been. Um, and then I realised the best form for me is to lead by example. So, you know, once again, it might be really hard. We'd be like, oh, you know, walking down in the city or walking down and seeing someone homeless. Be like, oh, I don't have time for that. Can't be bothered. But I think that when other other members in society encourage us to do that or we see like little like for example I was on the train I was on the tram or something and there was a normally you see really negative experiences and then you forget there's actually a really positive humans out there that are doing stuff and they don't need an award um and there was a guy sitting down um and he had like this duffel bag and he looked a bit like edgy and he was just like, you know, like uh, you could tell the smell was coming from him and like he, his clothing was a bit dirty um, and he was kind of like talking to himself and then there was a guy sitting next to me eating a banana and then the guy who with the duffel bag was like, oh, that smells really nice. That banana smells really nice. I haven't eaten for days. And the guy with the banana is like, oh, okay, well, I don't really need this banana. Why don't you just finish it? And he's just like... Oh, you sure, mate? You sure? What? Are you sure? And he's like, yeah, man. And, and he starts telling his story about his girlfriend. I'm trying to find my girlfriend. My phone's died. I'm trying to find someone. And she, we don't have food for today. And he goes, well, then what are you going to have for dinner? And he's like, oh, I don't know. He's like, well, here's 10 bucks, and that'll last you and your girlfriend. And then, like, here are some services you can go to. And it was just like that actually inspired me next time I saw and it is like we're all guilty of it like I'm honest with myself of course when I walk past every homeless person in Melbourne city I don't stop I don't but then those times that I've seen other people do it it's reminded me and put a little seed in my brain to next time to stop or if anyone needs help and that is 
I, I recently talked about the turban and our identity as Sikhs and I've been brought up um, to believe that the reason why we have this identity is because if anyone needs help on the street that turban represents um, you can trust me and if you need anything you can come to me for help um, and that's why I've been taught that if anyone ever comes to me for help um, I, I can't deny them that right so um, yeah that's definitely to do with my upbringing and my parents but I think it's just about being in, leading by example and if a couple of people start doing that and then more, it'll just keep on growing because we see each other as examples. And also seeing each other as family. I feel like, you know, I know that's a bit weird to say and a bit touchy-feely, but um, I, I definitely do see when, a Muslim, you know, after the Sydney siege, when the, the Muslim girls were getting their, you know, hijabs ripped off and I was at a shopping centre while that was happening. And just seeing that made me physically feel something. And that's, that's once again empathy and that's also imagining that, that could have that's my sister or you know my why I feel so passionately about I always go into like a room full of Sikh men and we're talking about these issues and I go well you know I don't get called a terrorist I don't get called a Sam Bin Laden if I walked into a job interview I'd probably get it because I've only I'm only brown there's not much else going on but <laughs> if I was if I was in a man's shoes a Sikh man's shoes I think my life would be very different and why do I feel so passionately about this why do I do poetry about you I could I could do my little acting streamline I could make some money go into Hollywood and do my thing and you know just love love that world but the reason why this path that a lot of us choose is definitely harder there's sacrifice in it but there's a reason and the reason is that we see each other like family and we see um, our family in others and I think it's really important to also see that when you you know there was a really good ad I recently saw about um, there was a young guy sorry I'm ranting there was a young guy <laughs> and he was actually like walking um, walking out of his house and he'd let, he got kicked out of home and it just showed his physical appearance looked normal like you know any other guy sitting over here and he's like walking and it shows a transition as the longer he was on the street the longer he was homeless his appearance changed he started getting a bit more ragged didn't have time to take care of himself and it just shows that that can happen to anyone and a lot of the cases I am using homelessness as like an example today but there's so many other cases that it can happen to anyone and once again it's a birth lottery it could have happened to me it could have happened to you and it's just we're just lucky that we weren't great citizen <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask a question around um, inspirational models globally. So, Tim, with your um, travel and your role um, in the global world, um, I'm personally very disillusioned. You mentioned in Africa about giving hopes and jobs and that there's a young demographic time bomb. Um, in the suburb that I um, choose as my home, we're in the top 2% of disadvantage in Victoria. And I very much on a regular basis on the bus in my interactions with my neighbours, I definitely see that. And this weekend is showing that when kids drop out of the education system, if they're Indigenous, um, you know, the higher incarceration rates. And so I see on a day-to-day -day basis this inequality um, very raw. And when I listen to the political parties and the aspirations of this country and the country that I grew up in, in the UK, I'm completely disillusioned. So can you give me some hope, please? Um, <laughs> around, um, now are, there, are there examples in the global world, um, in developing countries um, or in you know, established Western countries where that inequality is being um, appropriately addressed and where there is hope? Sure. Well, I wrote a book on hope. I'll find a copy for you later. <laughs> uh, so uh, th it is certainly the case that we are seeing uh, bad governance, conflict, war, fragile places uh, seeming to increase and 60 million refugees, most of them, by the way, uh, Australia gets hysterical about the few we have, but most of them are in Pakistan, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, <coughs> Kenya, you know, Dadaab, uh, which is uh, Somali's la largely a failed state. Uh, Dadaab camp in Kenya, 350,000 people. They've been there 25 years, and it is just terrifying because uh, Kenya's now saying, too long, go back. Well, where do you go? 
where do you go uh, in, in Somalia? 99% of girls suffer FGM. Uh, and the young Somalian woman who set herself alight on a roux, which didn't move our political leaders at all, was the thought that she can only go back home. Uh, well, I, if I was a girl, I wouldn't be going back home there. Uh, and I totally understand her despair. So there is that reality that we are seeing a, a, a breakdown that is producing uh, a whole lot of refugees. Look, in terms of hope, we've always looked toward the uh, Scandinavian model where there is a high uh, social equity wage inclusion trade-off and they always rate as the least corrupt in the world. There is transparency. Of course the refugee uh, intake is even seeing Sweden and these countries now that have always been very welcoming and the beacons of hope starting to go boy this is this is overflowing us. This is why I'm so angry about Australia's policies uh, because we've been shirking our responsibility and having a leave pass and passing it off to the rest. Um, the really tricky thing is this we are retribalizing at a time when we've never before needed global solutions and global governance, not government, governance, and we only have national levers to pull. The retribalizing is walls, so Donald Trump blames Mexicans, Muslims, Chinese immigrants. Basically, we saw with the global challenges of the um, financial system make meltdown, and what I mean by global challenges, whether it's climate change, refugees, terror, global finance, global epidemics, no one nation can actually solve this now. We actually have to have a global ethic to solve this. That's what I mean by global governance. Base erosion and tax havens and all of that. Um, so, in that world, we are seeing nations retribalize and retribalizing always goes to the old gods. The old gods, you've been talking about them, are colour and soil and nativism and people who are different threaten us. They're the old gods and they're very powerful. When Peter Dutton said what he did, and a lot of us here go, oh, Australians aren't going to buy that. Let me tell you, there's a lot of Australians who, bought, who are buying what Peter Dutton says, because they are buying into those old energies. I call them the old gods. Trump is a success because, at one level, because he is absolutely pushing those buttons. And the sort of human rights, image of God, colour, race, ethnicity, religion, actually are sexuality aren't the defining matters of what it means to be human but a universal internationalist view it's it's under profound attack at the moment that's what's going on so that's not a very hopeful statement <laughs> uh, but it is a a statement of where the contest line is um you know being stuck for 15 years in a toxic, paralysing debate about boat people arriving here, I think has coarsened and damaged the Aussie soul. Mm. And I, it was, it's only thinkable to have smashed aid by 30% because if you can't have empathy for mm. people arriving here yeah. who are fleeing persecution, little wonder you have empathy elsewhere. Uh, so... Um, We've got to try and keep hope alive. Uh, we have to name those old gods that do stir race and ethnicity um, because that, that's what the contest is at the moment. I think we have time for one last question. The first is more a comment, um, or it is a comment, and it's not meant to be critical but a reflection. Tim, you talked before about boat people and you said what I hear all the time on radio, TV, and every time I hear it, I cringe because I think it separates us and not connects us, and that is those people, these people, those people. We have to find a new word because I really do think it separates us. The other is talking about gods. Um, I've often heard people say that 
God or their faith gives them their morality. And I'd like, particularly Tim, but I'd also like Sujit to uh, answer this or talk about this. As an atheist, I believe that's not true. I believe that I don't need a God to give me morality. I don't need a God to tell me what's right and wrong and how to treat other people. So, um, I agree with you. Uh, but values do not materialise out of thin air. I think everyone, including atheists, live by faith. Faith is a category that says, I plant my feet on what I believe are solid values, though I can never empirically prove these values. Because those sorts of values of universal human rights, if you actually read the Declaration, behind them is really a spiritual appeal to human, it was brotherhood, human brotherhood and connection. But that's a faith commitment. People. People uh, have to make a faith leap to accept that view of life. It doesn't, there's no empirical evidence that uh, humans, in fact, if you actually look at life, you would say the empirical evidence is that humans are profoundly differentiated in intelligence, in power, in different degrees of worthiness. That's what the empirical evidence shows you. And there's a whole lot of those, I call them the old gods of blood and soil, that are driving that. So that's just the first question. I don't think there's as much that separates us as you think. The second question is this. Faith for me, and for most of the world, is where those values come from. Now that's not to say that you can't have values, don't have values, because you don't have faith. It's a different statement. Uh, what secular Australia doesn't quite understand is that most of the world is profoundly religious. And when we're doing our work in over a hundred countries, and by the way we employ 7,000 Muslims and Hindus, and we're a Christian agency, but we actually have a far easier time than secular agencies in Afghanistan and Syria and elsewhere. Because for most of the world, secular is a completely incomprehensible category. They say secular. How do you name a child? How do you have a wedding? Rightly or wrongly, they say secular means you don't really have a, a culture. That's how they think. So in Afghanistan, we have trained 380 imams. Now, this is World Vision, a Christian organisation. In reading the Quran with a gender lens not to sanctify domestic, uh, uh, violence against women. 380 imams and they're out and using what is their source of authority because it is. You can go and say, oh by the way the Quran's nonsense but you're not going to get a hearing and you're not going to actually shift the dial. So <clears throat> to try and get over what I think is just not practical, namely, and I, I speak, by the way, at the Sunday Assembly for atheists, you know, you, <laughs> I love speaking there actually, because uh, it begins with, uh, we're going to sing because singing uh, releases endorphins, and endorphins are good for our health, <laughs> and then we, we sing let it be, or, you know, great, I like it. Me and Bob Maguire and lots of others, you know, we, we're always asked in, and I think that's terrific. But to actually understand where most of the world is, it is in a religious zone. And uh, if you're going to actually move the dial, you've got to be speaking plausibly within that energy field. You want cool. Um, I. <laughs> that was fab. Um, I love your question. Love your work. What was your name again? Chris, right? Chris. Okay, cool. Well, I've been taught um, that as Sikhs we don't really convert because um, we believe that everyone's on their own little path and we shouldn't hinder that path and everyone should do their own thing. And I would like Chris to be the best Chris she can be and she can only be the best Chris she can be. She can't be me and I can't be her. So I've been taught to be the best Sujit I can be and that means to be the best human. I mean, my mum might call me an alien but I think I'm a human and I think that if we bring it down to the human level and 
actually, um, I, don't, I don't actually believe in the Sikh religion. I believe in the Sikh faith, but I don't believe in the Sikh religion. And that's why, uh, you might be asking why, and, and it's because with religion, I know this is a very like 21-year-old thing to say, but the whole, <laughs> that system, and the, the, the way in which it's built, I'm starting to question a lot of things in that. And the reason why I harp on about Sikh, 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 I'm like the Italian, everyone, my Italian friend says, you're like the Italians, you remind me of your nonna, you're just trying to bring everything down to Sikhs invented this, Sikhs invented that. And I'm like, well, the reason is because it's so cultural. And if I've had to have been brought up in Australia where I've had to prove how Australian I am every breath that I take, then I bloody well have to talk about Sikh all the time. Because it's, it's, such, a, it's such a personal thing and faith is such a personal thing. And no, you don't need God to tell you what to do. No, you don't need anyone to tell you what to do. I don't actually believe that when, you know, this might be very... Sorry, I don't really filter, so I might get in trouble for saying this. But I also think that um, when I work with Sikh youth and, you know, we have a lot of um, priests and preachers and people that travel around the world, um, and at the end of everything that I've talked about or we've done a workshop or we've done, um, or I've performed and talked about my views, um, I also at the end say, you know what, you should also chuck everything I've said out the window because it's up to you. You've got, you've got a brain, you've got opinions, you've got your own set of shoes that have had so so many experiences in them and it's up to you to decide what's best for you I'm not here to say that but in saying that we also shouldn't diminish the work that someone has done because they come from a faith or because they happen to prescribe to a certain religion and they identify with something and I think that's when um, when it can get a bit icky I think that sometimes we you know the G word God is very it's like a taboo in Australia I think to talk about and I feel very weird talking about it in Australia right now because I'm so used to not talking about it and in school we weren't allowed to really talk about that so that's fine because it it is a very personal thing and it's such a personal thing that that's why a lot of people will feel um, very strongly about it. No, I don't believe in terrorism. No, I don't believe in ISIS. No, I don't believe that we should all kill each other and bomb each other's heads off. But what I do believe is that you know, just like someone that is lactose intolerant doesn't mean that every person in the world who's lactose intolerant um, is now a horrible person. Because that's just like one, that's a dietary need. That's like something in their body that they're doing. Um, and I don't think that anyone has a right to judge what anyone wants to do um, as long as it's not hurting anyone. And that's a very cliche thing to end with. But, yes, thank you. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> There's a story, I don't know if it's true, I think it is true actually, that when uh, Bertrand Russell, the great philosopher, was interned in the First World War as a conscientious objector, the uh, warder who was taking details asked him his religion. He said, agnostic. He said, hmm, haven't heard of that one before, but agnostic, Christian. There's so many religions, but at least we all believe in the one God. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> That's, that's not a note on which to end. Uh, but there, there, there is something to say, and that is, we began, and, and there's been a refrain in, in a lot of the sessions that we've had, complaints about the quality of the conversation in our parliaments. Well, conversation is a euphemism. Uh, and we're right to complain about it, because I don't know if it was ever lower than this, but it would be difficult. Nevertheless, that's not the only site of conversations where conversations about important things should happen. And our public conversations have not been very distinguished over some long time. Part of the purpose that the centre, as I understand it, had in encouraging and starting this is not simply to have people up here tell you what they think and what perhaps they think you should think about this and that, but rather to start and extend the conversation between us and you and between you and you and you and others and I think it's a wonderful enterprise I can say that because I'm just brought in I'm not part of it <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, and I I'm amazed actually at the experience of the two of these events that I've witnessed and I'm grateful to you I'm grateful to these it was a very lovely way to end to end at two and a half or one and a half two, actually, days of conversation. And so I'm grateful to you both. And
And I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to them. I'm a pretty grateful guy. And I think you should be too. <laughs> Thank you very much.